my brief was to reflect on what I've heard so far during the course of the morning and um, the thing that uh, uh, I reflect on first is some of the comments by the Minister, um, particularly his very kind words about uh, former Ministers, of course I entirely endorse those, um, uh, of course I would, but I think he, there's a number of things I want to just pick up on. Uh, the Minister's right to talk about the demographic challenge um, and also the fact that expectations are changing and ratcheting up uh, year on year. Um, and that expectation that the user's voice, the individual's voice, will be heard in the system uh, and that there is real choice is, I think, a very important uh, uh, takeaway and message from all of this. Um, I thought that Rob's point particularly was important about just the vision that we now have that sort of is a unifying vision across the system, that this five-year forward view does provide perhaps a rallying point uh, across health and social care, uh, independent sector and public sector alike. But it isn't a plan and the plan is still <coughs> emerging and it's not emerging fast enough uh, when we consider that we have deficits within the provider sector of the NHS <coughs> of over £900 million in the first quarter of this year and when we reflect on the fact that local authorities aren't allowed to even <coughs> contemplate deficits one understands the sort of tensions that are sitting in the system in terms of the uh, disputes and arguments and debate about where the money uh, goes and is most uh, effective <coughs> in the way in which uh, uh, it can affect the system. So there's a word that I haven't heard used but which I think sums up a lot of the present and that's fragility. Uh, I've heard it a lot as I've been going around the country for a piece of work I'm doing with NHS providers at the moment looking at issues around delayed transfers of care uh, and uh, that is when I talk to chief executives and others of NHS Trust they are concerned about the ecology in which they are sitting and the state of the care markets that they are engaging with whether it's domiciliary care or whether it's residential care that they are fragile and unable in some cases to respond at the sort of pace that uh, they would need to be able to be confident about managing transfers of care and um, you asked the question just now about winter um, and uh, the issue about winter and delayed transfers of care is that there was a big focus over the winter on managing weights in A&E and delayed transfers of care but if you look at the figures nothing really changed over the summer it, the figures stayed pretty much the same for levels of delayed transfers of care uh, and, and there is a real continuing building pressure in the system and what I hear are increasingly hospitals that coped last year having to do some quite serious redesign of their processes to be confident that they will have grip on these problems this year. So it's a real live issue and if we have a bad winter and the forecasts are that it's going to be mild again then uh, I think all bets would be off. Um, Rob rightly talked about resilience uh, planning groups at a local level. I just wonder how many in this room have actually ever been invited to take part in local resilience planning groups? You're the same person who put the hand up earlier, so you obviously get invited to everything, but that's, that's great. Um, and there's two or three hands went up. The point is absolutely right, that how can you properly plan for resilience and the ability to escalate when problems are occurring if you don't have the provider sector, both the NHS part of the provider sector, but the independent sector in the room, so you understand what the capacity is. It is crazy not to have that voice uh, and that intelligence uh, in the room, but it's also crazy that, um, and the OG I think is absolutely right to have identified this, to uh, portion the funds to cope with and manage and ensure resilience in the system in a way that puts the lion's share of that money into the NHS rather than into investing in capacity beyond the NHS to avoid admissions at the front door of hospitals and also to facilitate speedier discharge at the back door. So that's, I think, a really important challenge, and I, I think it's helpful that Rob is saying that. And it's really helpful to have powerful voices in the NHS making the case and banging the drum for social care. We need more of it. We need it to be even louder, I would say, uh, in terms of uh, taking things forward. Now, there was a question about the Carter Review, um, and I just want to touch on that very briefly. Um, and I have to say, I put exclamation marks and question marks when I sort of saw this this morning, the idea that the, uh, the future of the NHS and managing these pressures is to build care homes and run them within the NHS. That really is back 30 or 40 years uh, in the NHS. Um, I think there is something, though, about the way in which the NHS uses its estate, and uh, it could be using it smarter, 
could be engaging with housing association providers, looking at housing solutions that then involve domiciliary and extra care type models. Um, and I thought the point that was being made by the Minister about variation and really surfacing and exposing and challenging variation, whether it's in clinical performance or whether it's in the way that different local authorities spend their budgets, is incredibly important. And making sure that we're not just looking at comparing institutions, but that we're also looking at comparing the decisions that individual decision makers are making. Because all too often the variation is not just at the institutional and area level, it's much more uh, granular than that. Um, and I, I thought that there was a, a really important point about the pressure of recruitment and retention that the Minister talked about. Um, and pay is part of this, and the challenge that you gave the Minister about the national living wage or the rebranded minimum wage um, is absolutely right. And when you consider that the Treasury will make a saving through reduced benefit payout, it is really hard to justify that that money is not being recycled back into making sure that the policy is deliverable without crushing uh, care businesses in its path. So that's an important challenge. But I think there is another issue, and it's about stigma. There is, and there's research that now shows this, a sense of stigma about working in this sector. And that is terrible. It's absolutely terrible that that is the case. And it's why I thought the Minister was right to talk about the media focus. Now we've got Alison Holt talking later on. Um, and we have to get a position where we're not just having a media that's interested in blame, but a, a, a media that's interested in celebration uh, of the good as well. Um, and that just brings me very quickly and in conclusion to the things that I picked up from the discussion earlier and my own reflections about the future. And again, this comes from some of the discussions I've been having about delayed transfers of care around the country. And it's about what does that future look like for this sector? Well, I think it's about value added. I think it's about how um, the sector uh, contributes alongside the fact that in terms of community and district nursing, there are shortages of district nurses around the country. There are not enough to do the tasks they currently are assigned to do. And when you look at the tasks they are doing, they are tasks that properly trained and skilled care workers could be doing instead. So there's a question about competencies, there's a question about skill mix, there's a question about making sure these groups work as teams and not as separate silos, which is the way in which they are all too often commissioned and organised at the moment. And I was somewhere on, went just yesterday, looking at the costs of different services. £60 a day for an enablement service, £14 a day for a home care service. This is a huge inappropriate mismatch of spend. There is more to be done to make sure that we are seeing this workforce used to support goals around enablement uh, and so on. Um, and my final point is really about, uh, and I can say this as a former minister, the temptation to reach for the cattle prod or the stick rather than work in a collaborative way as a minister is very, very great. It is huge because it's the easy thing to do to address the immediate presenting pressures of a voracious media that want action now rather than one that is perhaps open to the possibility that change takes time and takes local leadership to really deliver. So I think that the challenge that Rob gave is an absolutely fair one, that what we need is leadership that is about enablement. And I think that's fundamentally about changing the default. It's about changing the default from one that says the norm is not to integrate to where it is the norm, to one where the sharing of information in the system, it is the norm rather than the exception, and one where the pooling of the money uh, and the sharing of the benefits of pooling that money is the normal practice. Um, and finally, I, as a former constituency <coughs> MP, would just say, if you've never been to see your constituency MP in the area where you are doing business, book an appointment to go to their surgery. Talk to them about the great things that your staff and you do in your community. Tell them about the problems. Because they may not do anything that day, but you know what? They may well sidle up to Alistair Burt and to George Osborne in the division lobbies and bend their ear because they are better informed as a consequence of you talking to them. Do not see that as a waste of your time. It is an incredibly important act. Wave the posters by all means, but get there and have that conversation face to face. Don't just send an email, don't just send a letter. They do not have the same impact as face-to-face -face contact. 
And this is a sector that understands face-to-face -face contact and relationships. You need to practice that when it comes to your lobbying as well. Thank you very much.